In this video, we will learn about time complexity. What is time complexity and why do we care? When you want to express how fast an algorithm runs, simply just measuring the time of how long it takes to run would not be such a good idea. That's because the results would depend on other factors like how fast the computer is or the size of the input. For example, a function working on an input of five elements would probably end faster than if it were to work on an input of 5,000 elements. So we need a generalized way of expressing how fast an algorithm is able to run, regardless of the size of the input or other factors. And that is what time complexity is all about. Time complexity is often expressed with big O notation. The big O is used to classify algorithms by how it behaves as the input size increases. Different time complexities, linear, constant, quadratic. Let's say there is a series of lockers and you have a book in one of those lockers, okay? Your task is to find the book and how you find the book represents the algorithm you're using. Linear. First, let's say you have no information about where the book is and you need to look into each locker one by one until you find the book. If it takes one second to open a locker and there are five lockers, in the worst case, it's going to take you five seconds, where the worst case would be when the book is in the last locker. If there are 10 lockers, it'll take 10 seconds, 100 lockers, 100 seconds, and so on. You can see that the time needed to find that book increases linearly as the number of lockers you need to check gets larger. In big O notation, this would be expressed as O of N, where N represents the number of lockers you'll need to scan. No matter how the line graph looks, when the time increases linearly to the input, the big O of the algorithm will still be O of N. For example, if it takes you three seconds to check one locker instead of one second, or you're super fast and it only takes you half a second to check a locker, you might find the book slower or quicker, but the big O of finding the book will still be O of N. Some algorithms might have a slow startup time. Uh, let's say you and me, we are both able to open a locker in half a second. But for me, um, I have to eat a sandwich for 10 seconds before I start to search. Even though I have a longer startup time, my algorithm is still asymptotically equivalent to yours. We'll talk about what asymptotically means later. So in summary, when we are talking about big O notation, the coefficients or constants don't matter. It's just O of N. We call this linear time complexity. Now let's look at another complexity, which we call constant time, O of one. Algorithms with constant time are considered to be good because no matter how large the input gets, it will still take the same time to perform a certain task. If we go back to the lockers, this time, let's say we have another person who's um, psychic and can guess which locker has the book. If the process of retrieving the book takes one second and there are five lockers, it will take one second to get the book. If there are 10 lockers, it'll still be one second because we know where the book is. And then 100 lockers, still one second. Let's say our psychic friend can guess the locker correctly, but it takes five seconds to use their powers. It might be slower than the one second algorithm, but it's still considered constant time. Another common time complexity would be quadratic time complexity, O of N squared, where the time increases quadratically to the input size. Let's put a little twist to the first example. Let's say you need a key to open each locker and the keys are jumbled up in a paper bag. You pick a random key and place it outside of the bag until you get the key for the locker you want to open. Once you have opened the locker, you'll put everything back in the bag and start again. You will have to repeat this process to open each locker and find the book. When n equals five, in the worst case, you need to pick the keys five times for each locker. So in total, you would have to pick the keys 25 times. If picking a key takes one second and we just assume that opening the locker doesn't take any time, it will take 25 seconds to find the book. When n is 10, you would have to pick the keys 100 times, 10 times for each locker. 
So the time needed to find the book will increase quadratically to the input. Now that we have a better understanding of what time complexity is, let's look a bit more into what asymptotic analysis means. So far, we looked into three different types of time complexities, constant, linear, and quadratic. When we plot them together, it would look like this. Let's say you want to compare two algorithms. One has linear time complexity, and the other one is quadratic. The plot would look something like this. You can see that linear time complexity runs faster, and this seems right. Linear is considered to be faster than quadratic. But let's say you run linear time complexity algorithm on a really slow computer. Then your plot would look something more like this. It seems here that the quadratic time complexity algorithm is actually faster than the linear. Do you see the problem here? When you're trying to say that this algorithm is more efficient than the other, the runtime shouldn't change depending on external factors like computing power. So we need a generalized way of expressing how fast an algorithm is, which is where asymptotic analysis comes in. As we put in a larger input, coefficients and constants in the function will become less significant. When we were running the linear complexity algorithm in a slower computer, we were changing the coefficient. But as the input size grows, you can see that it doesn't matter at the end. Eventually, linear time complexity algorithms will run faster. This is what I was talking about in the sandwich eating example. Even if I eat a sandwich for 10 seconds before I start looking for the book, that wouldn't be such a big deal if there are hundreds and hundreds of lockers to search. When you compare an algorithm that is asymptotically more efficient than the other, then it's guaranteed to be faster eventually as you keep increasing the input size, no matter the constants or the coefficients. And when we are trying to figure out the big O of an algorithm, we also need to drop the non-dominant terms. For example, let's say there is a function that consists of three parts that runs sequentially. The first part and the second part has an algorithm of O of n squared. And the third part is an algorithm of O of n. You would think that this would be O of 2 times n squared plus n, but this function is actually just O of n squared. Because first, we drop the constant and the coefficients. Then we only choose the highest order and drop the rest. So it's just an O of n squared. So we've seen three types of time complexities. Constant time complexity is when we're just doing a simple operation. Linear time complexity is when we have to loop through the input. And quadratic time complexity is when there is a loop in a loop. There is also logarithmic time complexity, O of log n. A common example for this is when the input size is divided into half for each loop. So the number of loops we need to run will be less than just a normal loop. There are also linear rhythmic algorithms, O of n log n, which is worse than linear time complexity, but better than quadratic. Cubic time complexities are even worse than quadratic time complexities. Just think of a loop in a loop in a loop. That would be horrible. Exponential time complexities, O of 2 to the n, will multiply the number of operations whenever there is an additional input. Think about the number of attempts we need to take to guess three digit password and four digit password. We increase the password length by one, but the number increased from 1000 to 10,000. If you see the six types of time complexities in this plot, it is pretty clear that in this order, the time complexity gets good to bad. When you compare an algorithm that is asymptotically more efficient than the other, then it's guaranteed to be faster eventually as you keep increasing the input size, no matter the constants or the coefficients. And when you're trying to decide which is the dominant term in your algorithm, you need to pick the worst one, which you can decide from this order. Let's look into an example. This example is about finding the two numbers in an array that sums up to the target. Let's say you can use the same number twice. For example, if the target is 12 and its input array is 7, 2, 9, 3, 11, it will return the indices of the values 9 and 3. If the target is 4, the function is looping each index of the array and for each index it loops again to see if they add up to the target. So it's a loop in a loop. 
this algorithm will have a quadratic time complexity. If there are five elements in the array, in the worst case, this line will be executed 25 times. If there are six elements, then six times six, 36, 36 times, and then so on. Let's look at another example. The first part of the function is a loop in the loop. This line will run n squared times. So the time complexity of this would be O of n squared. The second part will run n times. We are just looping n times, so it will be O of n. We drop the O of n because it is not dominant, so the time complexity of this function will be O of n squared. So far, we talked about what time complexity is, why we should care about it. We also talked about linear, constant, and quadratic time complexity, and we talked about asymptotic analysis. That's it for time complexity. I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.